Let's move now to some of the latest science news around COVID-19. Nicotine patches could help prevent the coronavirus. That's according to a study by French researchers. Let's uh, take a closer look at this and other uh, latest news on the science front. I'm joined by Professor Alex Broadbent from the Institute for the Future of Knowledge. She's a philosopher of science, medicine and epidemiology. Prof, thanks so much for joining us. Let's delve first into this study. It is only one study that was done, but it's suggesting that nicotine patches might be useful in fighting COVID-19. We get articles like this all the time. How do we know what's worth paying attention to and what's really just some idea that we should actually discard? Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's a very difficult question. Uh, Fundamentally, the answer is uh, that we should always see such things as interesting hypotheses that are going to be subject to future investigation. Most research that comes out on early stage uh, promising drugs on anything uh, is not then uh, it doesn't yield the promising results that it was supposed to have done. That's just unfortunately the way it is. Uh, in this particular instance, the reason they are thinking that nicotine may be uh, uh, may be protective is that uh, the risk of COVID-19 among sm smokers seems to be a bit lower, uh, contrary to what one would have expected um, uh, than among non-smokers. And the only plausible thing they can imagine might be nicotine. Nicotine does have other medical uses, um, so they're looking at it. But uh, it's not that it's something that's going to be, you know, going to be rolled out, and certainly is not the sort of thing where people should go charging out to buy nicotine patches. And it certainly doesn't mean that we should all immediately start smoking again, even if we could right now. Am I right? No. Yes. Smoking, uh, I mean, there's two reasons. One is that smoking is extremely bad for you, and that would really very much be a case of jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. Uh, secondly, there is no evidence that smoking is actually protective. Uh, you've got to distinguish between a lack of evidence that it's damaging, and I think it's important that I say that. There is, there is no evidence base for the idea that smoking is bad for people with COVID-19. So if the government says there is, uh, they're wrong about that. There isn't an evidence base for that. But nor is there an evidence base for thinking that smoking is good for people with COVID-19. That there isn't an evidence base either way. We don't know. What we have not seen is a strong correlation, as was initially suspected, um, between people who smoke and people who get COVID-19. And that is surprising and newsworthy among scientists because smoking is bad for us in almost every way that we look at, uh, in very, very many ways. So the nicotine patches is interesting, very early, worth exploring, basically. Am I right? Exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's something that's certainly worth look, watching, but... Uh, uh, where, where that will go is very hard to predict, and very often these promising things don't work out. You say that there's no evidence uh, to suggest directly that COVID-19 is exacerbated by smoking, but increasingly what we're hearing about uh, this virus is that it could have uh, an impact on the vascular system, and we know that when you smoke, you constrict your blood vessels. So surely there's, there are many, many reasons why you shouldn't be smoking um, around COVID-19. Well, that's not what the evidence says. I mean, uh, one of the complex things about medical science is that the body is a fantastically complicated thing and it responds in all sorts of ways to different things. Um, th th there is no evidence, uh, and they have done systematic reviews on this. Uh, uh, there was one published early in April. There isn't evidence, or that the, the, you can't say that there is an evidence base mm. for the view that smoking uh, increases the risk of serious complications of COVID-19. I'm not saying there is no evidence. If somebody comes along and does a study tomorrow, though, that wouldn't be an evidence base. Right. For an evidence base, you need a... But precautionary a, 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 a principle a would apply here. Yeah, I'm just running out of time, and I've got so many questions to ask, okay. to ask you. Um, what about vaping? Is vaping dangerous, not dangerous? Do we not know? There isn't any evidence to suggest that it is. So the, the, the peer review... Uh, Report in uh, 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 systematic review said covered vaping too. No, there isn't. There isn't evidence that it's dangerous, mm. and I, I don't think a precautionary principle applies. Certainly, when the government enacted the Disaster Act, they certainly didn't enact it on the basis of protecting people generally from the harms of smoking. And if they want to do that, they can legislate. I want to talk about two other pieces of information. Um, in America, the FDA has just approved remdesivir, which is, my understanding, it's an, uh, an antiviral drug that's been used for Ebola, and it may help cut down um, the people who get uh, COVID-19 very, very seriously. 
Is this what you'd say is quite a potentially hopeful breakthrough? I think one again has to be very cautious. I mean, the, the, there have been two, uh, I've found two studies on it. One was inconclusive. One suggests an effect, but it's got a high risk of bias surely, because of its... It, surely if an FDA, yeah. we get to the stage where the FDA, for example, approves something, surely it's much further down the line in terms of looking at the pros and cons, and therefore it's hopeful. No, that's not the case. I mean, uh, not all of the FDA's decisions are, are correct, and many have been quite obviously wrong. So I don't think one, one should sort of think, well, because the FDA has done it. Right. In fact, it's, it, it's, I mean, if you look at the objective measures using standard evidence-based to evidence tests, the way you want to sense this evidence generally, and this objectively it counts as a high risk of bias because it's an interim result. And when people release interim results, they're at risk of releasing either, not, not, uh, not deliberately, but just it's a chance positive result. So you announce it, which is very natural. But it could just be chance. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's not the case. Again, it's, it's hopeful. It's interesting. It, it's mm. plausible. It's an antiviral drug. But again, what, what one can't. I mean, we, there's a real temptation to believe what we want to believe and see evidence for what we want uh, to believe. And, and that's a that's a well-known human cognitive trait. Yeah, and I suppose we're all desperate for cures and vaccines and answers yeah. at a time of uncertainty. Thank you so much for your views. That was Professor Alex Broadbent from the Institute for Thanks. the Future of Knowledge.